Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Melinda Zeder. She is Curator Emeritus in the Department of Anthropology of the National Museum of National History, Smithsonian Institution. Her zooarchaeological research has revolutionized the understanding of animal domestication. She has conducted extensive fieldwork throughout the Near East, including in Iran, Israel, Turkey, and Syria. Her research focuses on the origins of plant and animal domestication and the impacts of agriculture on human prehistory. She has also pioneered approaches that combine archaeological and genetic analysis of plant and animal remains from archaeological sites. So, Dr. Zeder, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. It's my pleasure. It's nice to see people in this time of quarantine. <laughs> that's that's certainly <laughs> true. Yeah, <laughs> even though it's at distance, right? <laughs> because we right. have to be careful. But uh, anyway, anyway. Uh, okay, so let's get into the topics of our conversation today. Uh, first of all, uh, this field of zooarchaeology. So, what is it really about? What are the kinds of topics that it's interested in? So archaeology or archaeozoology, it's either either one, um, is basically an interest in the history of human interaction with animals. Um, and uh, it can be defined um, with an emphasis on either the archaeology or on the zoology. So those coming at it from a zoological point of view are interested in how humans have shaped animals over time and how that interaction has had an impact either on the biology, the genetics, the behavior, the distribution um, over time. The anthropologists or the archaeologists, which is my background, come at it more from the human point of view, is how is that interaction with animals shaped the course of human um, uh, culture and evolution, biological and cultural evolution. Um, the work is done primarily through the analysis of animal bones that are recovered from archaeological sites uh, so that they are uh, material remains of actually that interaction through time. Um, and so it requires then a uh, uh, just to do the sort of technical aspect, a good understanding of zoology, uh, a good, maybe even a talent for um, three-dimensional recognition of patterns. So those of us that do this can uh, and have a talent for it um, can see a shape, remember a shape, and say, mm, that looks like you know this or that animal. So we're very good at jigsaw puzzles, for example. Um, so, but most of all, and I think the most important part about zooarchaeology, there's a, you know, there's a great deal of technical aspect of, you know, being able to identify the animals, being able to quantify, being able to employ various techniques to look at um, these remains. But the, the key part of zooarchaeology or archaeozoology are the questions one asks about the archaeological remains and about this history of human interaction. So the, the primary questions that seem to come up, whether you're looking at it from the zoology point of view or from the archaeology, um, are initially questions um, about how did humans then procure animals from the wild, hunting techniques, uh, what did that mean for uh, the of human early human evolution, how did being able to hunt uh, large animals or even small animals affect the course of human evolution? What are their questions about sharing of meat and how did that shape human evolution? And most of these examples um, I give will probably reflect my interest in the human side. So you'll have to talk to someone from the zoology side to get an emphasis on that. So that's a major area of study of these early human evolution. How did humans then interact with these animals um, and, and how did that help shape human evolution? Obviously another extremely important question, which is the question that I now work with um, in my own research, is how did domestication of animals come about? 
What were the uh, impetus of it? How did it happen? How did it affect human um, societies? How did it affect the, the course of evolution of the animals? And also, how do we know from the archaeological record? How can we, from a fragment of bone, tell it was wild or domestic? So there's another big chunk of questions. And then if you're going to move up a little bit more in time, the questions that first began to interest me as a, as a graduate student uh, working in Iran, on a, one of the first cities uh, in that part of the world, was what happens when people move from economies in which they raise their own animals for their and their plants for their own consumption, so sort of a small-scale agricultural economy, to one in which you have an urban economy, in which you have various people specializing in various activities um, in, in administration and making pottery and so on, and then other people specializing in, in agriculture. And how does that come about, and how do we know from the archaeological animal bones? So there's a, a, a great sort of panoply of questions um, that one can address through this, and which is something that personally attracted me to it, in that animals intersect our lives in so many ways, um, and that, that their remains are so common in archaeological um, um, contexts, or at least many of them. So it provides us a natural avenue to give insight into the sort of greatest hits of human evolution. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and you mentioned two topics there that are also two of the main ones in your research that uh, have to do with agriculture and animal and plant domestication associated with agriculture, right? So uh, let's start with domestication. Uh, do we know or do we already have developed proper uh, techniques, tools and scientific approaches to know uh, how plant and animal domestication progressed over time and the kinds of changes that occurred both for the plant and animal species that we domesticated and then the impact that they had on ourselves and our evolution. Well, the techniques are getting better and better all the time. And that's actually, you know, this question of, of plant and animal domestication is, you know, uh, been a key question in archaeology going back more than 100 years. But what makes it such a hot topic now and why you see it so often featured in the, the primary uh, literature, the big, um, you know, science, nature, PNAS, and so on, is that we now have a revolution of techniques that we can use to actually watch that process happen in the archaeological record. So we have basic um, techniques that are improving all the time, and, and this is something I've spent a great deal of my own career uh, working on, of, of how do we detect that change just through the plant and animal remains uh, from archaeological sites. What are the telltale markers of domestication? Um, and those can either be... And, um, Originally, people really focused on this, what they call morphological change, or the change in the in the shape or the body of the, either the plant or the animal. Things like in seeds, with with uh, domestication, uh, tend to get bigger. Now, in part, that's because people are selecting for bigger seeds, but it's also because that's to the advantage of the plant that's planted in a, in a seed bed to have bigger seeds that can sprout faster and outcompete um, competitors in that seed bed. But there's a marked change that you see over time in seed size that can be used um, as a marker of domestication or changes in the way that the plant uh, distributes seeds. Um, there's a in the wild, uh, many plants, uh, when they're ready to, to disperse seeds, their seed pod becomes very brittle. Um, and shatters on contact, spreading the seed widely. Well, with human cultivation and human collecting of those seeds, there was a selection for those seeds that stay in the pod, that make it back to the settlement, um, that are then processed and replanted. So we see that change. In animals, um, there are uh, changes uh, not as quickly in the morphology, more in the behavior, but the so that there, those are more leading edge to that 
But what pr people have traditionally looked for are things like thought to be a change in the size, overall size of animals over time, that the domesticates are thought to get smaller over time. Uh, there's also changes that are very distinctive in uh, animals like sheep and goat and cattle in the shape and the size of the horns. And that's really because uh, people, once they start selecting who breeds with whom, uh, there's no more a selective advantage in having great big horns to compete for for females or to attract to be, you know, sort of a lure to be more handsome. Uh, and actually, there's probably selection against it, both it's a very heavy and and uh, it's a heavy energy load to, to grow and carry those. And plus, people are selecting for more docile animals. So we see a change in that. But as we begin to understand domestication better um, and understand that it's not so much a sort of on off light switch that you go from wild to domestic that there's a you know that there's a threshold that once a plant or animal crosses it it becomes a domesticate as opposed to being a wild but it's a long very continuous process that we now know in both plants and animals may stretch over hundreds if not a thousand years or more what we're beginning to look at more than just the uh, mark these changes in, in body form or seed form, which we now know are actually kind of late in the process. What we're looking for is more the leading edge of these markers of domestication um, that indicate that humans and the plants and the animals are coming closer together. So, for example, a lot of my work has been devoted to looking at the change in the strategies that a hunter might apply in, in, in their hunt get the most meat back for the hunt. I sort of flippantly call it the most uh, buck for your bang. Um, but that that would have the hunter focus on certain kinds of, of animals, uh, often um, the larger males in a, in, a, in a bunch of wild animals, whereas a herder is more interested in having a herd. And so, so they're going to have a slightly... Uh, Strategy. And that tends to be in many animals that they will, um, you only need a few males to perpetuate the herd so that it, you kill males um, when they reach a, a good age to, to get meat back, uh, but before they become a real pain in the neck. And then you keep your females around as long as they are producing young, and then you begin to slaughter them. So I've been working with techniques record to reconstruct the ages of the animals that are killed and the sexes of the animals that are killed that can begin to pe tease out those changes. So those are sort of ways of looking at the archaeological record to detect domestication. We've also had a huge revolution in the last uh, 15, 20 years years, but every year it seems that, that our capacities increase exponentially in, in, the, in genetics. So not only and in part because of, of uh, crop science and, and animal livestock sci uh, science more developed for the industries themselves, but we're beginning to understand not only the genetics uh, differences between um, domestic plants and animals and their wild ancestors, but we're beginning to be able to have increasingly uh, better techniques for extracting DNA from archaeological specimens, which is really the sort of um, gold standard of looking at the genetics of uh, plant and animal domestication. Is really, if you if you focus on the modern, you have ten thousand years at least of humans and animals and plants fiddling around together. So you have to sort of sort through that. But if you can go back 10,000 years in extracting DNA from the plant and animal remains that are really at the initial stages of domestication, then we can begin to look at what are the genetic impacts of that increasingly close relationship that we're beginning to understand through the archaeology, through techniques like I told you about with uh, the change from hunting to herding, um, how do the genetic changes correspond to those. Um, so we're beginning archaeology and the genetics are sort of a coming together of our two sets of techniques that we can then um, understand 
the whole process a little bit better by looking at both sides of that. We're also getting um, better and better chemical techniques that are coming a lot with animals and sometimes with plants. Um, with the animals, we can now extract um, various isotopes of, of from the collagen in the bone of either carbon or nitrogen or oxygen that then uh, give us an insight into what those animals were eating. Um, and we can begin to look at the change from uh, totally a wild foraging process to one in which maybe human um, their diet with um, grains that they've grown um, or that, they, that they're beginning to move these animals from place to place. That's where oxygen comes in, where we can look at the different water um, types that these animals are eating and then we begin, begin to look how they're moving. Uh, also in the plants that they're beginning to be I'm in a very remote place, so our internet is often bad. Yeah. Um, so with the plants, we're beginning to be able to detect through the chemicals what kind of uh, soils and which are uh, being artificially watered by humans, for example. So we're getting more and more of uh, techniques from different sciences that are all coming together to look at this long process of the increasingly close relationship between humans and plants and animals through time. And that's what really clearly makes it such an exciting area of research. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, I, I'm not sure to what extent this question makes sense, because I imagine that uh, there was a slow progression from uh, hunter-gatherers and people that didn't have any kind of domesticated animal or plant or any kind of agricultural practice toward societies that were basically uh, settlements, sedentary settlements of people that used domesticated animals and plants in their daily lives. Uh, but. Uh, is, is it possible to say, with the knowledge that we have nowadays, what came first? If people were first uh, forced or in some way by the circumstances to domesticate plants or animals, or, uh, and then uh, came agriculture, or was it the case that they were already using some uh, animal species and plant species to produce this or that, uh, uh, and then, I mean, they simply became sedentary? Well, uh, there's a lot to unpack in the question, as you recognize. Um, it's, I think it's important to recognize that agriculture and domestication are very closely related, but they're different things. Domestication, to me at least, and, and to most people, really focuses on that relationship between the human and the plant and the animal. Um, and, and I tend to, to characterize it in terms of a sort of a biological sense that it's a, a, a mutualism in which both partners get something from it, um, it that over time, as they invest more in it, each one begins to change more, either genetically or through behavior or so on, that that um, increases their dependence on it. Um, that's, to my mind, domestication. Agriculture is a system, the way I would define it, and I think increasingly as people define it, is an economic system that is based primarily on, on the production of domesticates so that most of the labor in the economic system is dedicated not so much to hunting and gathering or, or collecting wild resources, but it's into producing domestic resources. And most of the calories that people eat are procured from crops and livestock that they've raised rather than free living plants and animals that they forage. So at least to my mind, uh, domestication has to come first because there have to be domesticates around before people can begin to um, uh, have a system that's based primarily on, on, um, on domesticates. And there's, as we begin to be able to detect the presence of domesticates and the presence of agricultural systems primarily based on domesticates, 
um, we see that there's, again, not only a long period of time that went from free-living plants and animals to domesticates, but a free, long period of time in which people had uh, what, actually my husband, who also works in this field from the plant side, um, would call low-level food production, where they have some plants and animals that they are growing, but they're relying on a wide array of other uh, plants and animals that they may do some management, but not a lot to totally free living into that system in which they are primary agricultural. Uh, in terms of sedentism, um, you don't need a domesticate to be sedentary, um, to have a sedentary year-round community where you don't move that much. Um, and what we tend to find in at least some areas of the world, and increasingly in most areas of the world, we're beginning to get good records of this trajectory from um, into domestication in, to agriculture, is we're beginning to see that sedentism may even precede uh, domestication. Uh, and that what seems to be the prerequisite for people to become more and more um, sedentary to circumscribe their their yearly uh, round of movements of procuring various plants and animals is a increasing concentration of um, resources that they might be interested in in a more circumscribed area a diverse array of those resources um, that are easily obtained uh, by settling in a central area and then moving out from that to to procure those. Uh, so we see uh, today there are good examples of it and also in the past of what, what one might call complex hunters and gatherers that are um, really quite sedentary. And a great example of this is the uh, Northwest Coast um, Native American tribes uh, that um, are year-round um, settlements, but are, at least initially, um, entirely uh, supported by wild, what were, are considered wild plants and resources, but they are located in areas where they have easy access to fish and to berries and to, and to terrestrial animals and so on, so they put together that package. Um, and in many areas of the world, now that where we're getting these increasingly clear records, what we're seeing is that um, this process towards domestication begins um, in in concert with a real change in environment following the last ice age, um, where we begin to see um, with the increasingly warmer and wetter climatic conditions. Uh, that we see uh, a change in plant and animal communities, uh, that they become more um, densely uh, distributed in la uh, across landscapes and more concentrated within landscapes. So for the area that I know the best um, in the Near East, mm -hmm. we have a very good record now of uh, the end of the Ice Age, of, of the climate getting warmer and wetter, resources becoming more um, uh, plentiful and more densely packed, and we see a, a, a progressive constriction of, of uh, people's movements to focus on those resources. Uh, and we, we see at the uh, very end of the last ice age, we have um, after this period called the Younger Dryas, which is a sort of brief return to ice age conditions, that happened between about 12,700 years ago and about 11,700, 600, 800 years ago. Um, we see at the beginning of what's called the Holocene or the early Holocene, our current geologic um, climatic era, uh, we see a, a, a real change in environments across the entire Near East. Uh, things are getting warmer and wetter. And across the Near East, people are beginning to form these small sedentary communities that are very strategically located at the confluence of multiple um, environmental zones where they can uh, find resources in a fairly circumscribed area and they settle there. And that, to my mind, sets up um, that context in which people can develop the relationships with plants and animals 
especially those that are more amenable to these kind of uh, long-term relationships that lead to domestication. So that's a rather long answer to your question, but I think it, it puts things in sort of a more of a chronological order that I think you have more sedentism, which is separate from either domestication or agriculture, uh, but is related to it in this case in that I think at least um, some degree of greater sedentism is important for initial domestication. Um, domestication coming about in those environments that as it becomes, as the plants and animals become more productive, uh, also as people begin to change environments to the extent that the wild plants and animals are no longer able to uh, survive as well, uh, people get more locked into growing plants and animals and then they move into agricultural. <laughs> right. So at a certain point there, you mentioned the Near East because it's a place that you've studied a lot, uh, also in terms of the origins of agriculture there. But uh, And you also talked about the conditions that promoted it. Uh, but th there were also uh, historically other places throughout the world, like for example in China and North America and South America, where agriculture developed independently. Right. Exactly. There, there are at least 11 or 12 other areas that we know of now and probably many more. Um, and uh, the primary areas for which we're getting good records now um, is China now is really coming online as a, uh, with wonderful work both done by Chinese scholars and by scholars from uh, other parts of the world. Uh, where we see a very similar trajectory as in the Near East, uh, at least as early as the Near East, also happening in this context of environment getting better, of people beginning to uh, settle down but exploit what they call a broad spectrum of these resources that they have access to, and then beginning to fiddle around with resources to try to um, change their growing conditions or their, their communities in ways that... Um, increase the returns from that. And we're beginning to understand that with millet domestication um, in the north of China, rice domestication uh, farther south in China. Uh, we're also, I have a student of mine that's working with pig domestication in China uh, that happens independently from the Near East. So we're getting a good record there. Um, <clears throat> my husband, Bruce Smith, who I mentioned earlier, has done a great deal of work in Eastern North America. And the transition there happens uh, later. It happens in this period called the Mid-Holocene, uh, which is about uh, 5,000 years ago as opposed to about 11,000 to 10,000 years ago. Uh, but it's another period uh, where people begin, um, with, again, in concert with some environmental change to settle more densely um, or to settle more, uh, not so much them densely, but to settle in areas where they can find a, a, an array of resources uh, and begin to experiment with various crops. Uh, this is sure. where they domesticated things like quinoa, well, quinoa or quinopodia. Quinoa was independently domesticated in South America. Um, but uh, things that are actually largely lost uh, at domesticates today, there's a maygrass and a variety of different plant domesticates that come out of, of, of that area of the world. Um, South America, we are, we're getting some understanding of uh, domestication of things like um, yama and alpaca, potatoes and so on. Mesoamerica seems, it's still very sketchy, our understanding. The domestication of things like squash is at least as early as some of the Near Eastern and the Chinese, maybe a little bit later. They seem to be more mobile at that time. So what we see is people beginning to, that are still moving, but are beginning to experiment with various uh, plants, things like corn, thing, or teosinte that then becomes corn, things like squash and so on, uh, later beans. Um, and it's a, it's a somewhat different trajectory um, before they actually move on to agriculture. So yes, we're, it, it, uh, we're getting good records now from uh, Africa, uh, where there's another uh, um, other kinds of millets uh, that were domesticated there. Uh, India, where things like water buffalo um, and again another kind of millet 
uh, were domesticated. So yes, there are areas all over the world, which again is great for us because it means that there are lots of places where we can work and where very critically we can get with these our, all these techniques that I mentioned to you are giving us a better, uh, and all of these techniques, one that I didn't mention is increasingly um, precise ability to date the remains. So we can situate these events in time with a great deal more accuracy that there are these now radiocarbon techniques that are, allow you to date very small amounts of the actual plant and animal remains. Um, so we're beginning to get from all of these areas of the world uh, a, a fairly robust, fine-grained record of the steps that people took along the way to begin to manipulate, to domesticate, to agriculture, where we can begin to compare, you know, our, what are the environmental context? What are the, how did people, what are the kind of plants and animals that they played with? Um, what is the timing? How long did it take? How much movement? So we can begin then to, to uh, really start talking about maybe some of the broad factors that may be in play everywhere that motivated this very important change, as well as some of the um, really critical local factors that sort of shaped the process um, as it as it unfolded in each of these different places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's interesting because at a certain point there you mentioned Africa and I was really not aware that uh, there were also uh, uh, agricultural developments occurring in Africa independently from the Near East, for example. In both East and West Africa, now we have records of, of domestication of various crops, teff and sorghum, um, as well as, um, as I mentioned, uh, a number of millets in West Africa. Again, a little bit later, and if we can talk, we'll talk maybe some about dispersal and the different records in Europe and so on. It's a different process, it's a different timing, but I think that the, the basic underlying message is that this isn't, and, and, and it's a change from the, maybe with the way we thought about this a oh, hundred years ago, but maybe even a, a, the way we thought about this is 50 years ago. So it's not an aha moment that happened in one place in the world or some genius thought it up and said, let's have agriculture and it spread. It's the result of people everywhere tinkering with their environment. It's a basic human trait. It's what we'll talk about later with niche construction. It's, it's people playing with their environment to try to manipulate that environment that in ways that benefit them. And people are inveterate tinkerers, that's what humans do. And so what we see is around the world, the results of those experiments of different people in different parts of the world using their deep knowledge of how their local environment works um, in ways that then benefit them and when they do the, that kind of tinkering with a plant or an animal that has a sort of biological capacity to respond because it is in the long run it's to the advantage of the plant or the animal to collaborate with humans um, not have a quality of life that is um, as optimal as they might have had on their own, but there's certainly a lot more of them now than there are there ones that live in the wild. So it, it where where that human um, tinkering comes into contact contact with plants and animals that are able to take advantage of it or are able to move into human environments in ways that make it to their advantage where those come together, then we see trajectories to agriculture. And that can happen anywhere in the world, and it does. And, and I think it's a testimony um, to the ingenuity of humans wherever they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, since you mentioned the concept of human niche construction, before we get into how agriculture spread from the Near East to Europe and other places, could you explain a little bit more that concept and what it is about? Niche construction um, is a term that's now um, come out of, well, actually one of the founders was an anthropologist, but it's been a, a, a term that has been really revolutionizing evolutionary biology, but it's fairly simple. It's basically an organism that either through, um, oh, I don't know, the way its body works or its activities, its behavior is 
manipulating an environment in such a way, changing that environment in such a way that it affects either its own evolution or the evolutionary trajectory of other ant plants or animals within that changed environment. So a great example, um, sort of the poster child of niche construction is a beaver. And you think of a beaver constructing a beaver dam, that they're, they're um, damming up uh, a, a stream or a, a, you know, a water course so that th that then not only provides them with housing and, and uh, in building a, a, both a dam and a beaver lodge, but it's then building a marsh area that kills a number of trees that makes it easier for them to collect those trees and bring them back and eat the bark and so on. But that activity is vastly changing that environment. And it's um, by changing that environment, they have then built a way where they can thrive and thus change their own evolution. And that behavior becomes more and more elaborate and so on. And you see the impact of the, how that's developed over thousands of years. But it has also affected the way evolution works for all of the plants and animals that live in that environment. Um, and in niche construction is, you know, widespread throughout basically almost all living things. Earthworms are great niche constructors in that they change the way that the soils are aerated. Um, and that has it had major impact. Some people even propose it's one of the major causes of some of the great evolutionary changes in, in you know, way back in time. Um, but they also plants are niche constructors that they move into new environments and take advantage of things and change their niche. Humans are what we would call the ultimate niche constructor because we have an ability, and this is a, um, a an ability that we've um, adopted and, and adapted and grown from what other animals have, but we've taken it to incredible extents in that we have an ability to um, n not sort of wait for evolution to happen and have changes in bodies and so on um, through the, the course of, of genetic change. But what we're able to do is to have a goal and to alter our behaviors in such a way as we can um, reach that goal. So the goal may be, I want to have more of these plants because I like to eat their seeds and they're nutritious and my family likes them and so on. And so I, I observe that those of uh, these plants that I see out in the wild that has more water, it does better. So I'm going to change that environment to water that plant. That's niche construction. And that's the kind of niche construction that can eventually lead to domestication. Or with humans, with looking at, Let's say they're hunting, and they're seeing that 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 uh, you know, with the kind of hunting that they're doing, with with focusing in a certain way, is depleting the 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 supply of those animals. Well, maybe if I focus my hunting strategies a little bit differently, I'm going to actually increase that supply, and through time, that change in hunting strategy um, becomes uh, actual management. So humans have that ability to. Um, have a goal to change their behaviors, to adjust that behavior according to the results of whether it works or not, and very importantly, they don't have to pass on the behavior through, you know, reproduction and genetic uh, transfer, but they can change, they can pass on that niche constructing behavior, the ones that work to their advantage, to their children and to communities. They have social learning. They have teaching. They can lead by example. They can they can tell stories about how things were done in the past. They can create whole systems of how you understand the way the stars work and how that relates to what's the good time to plant as opposed to uh, a good time to harvest. So they have that ability to sort of turbocharge these um, niche construction relationships that in nature may take a lot longer to work. Um, into something that is much more powerful um, and much to, more to our advantage. Um, so basically that's the, con the concept of niche construction um, and how it is something that we have taken from something that 
basically all plants and animals do, but through our ability for social learning through culture, um, have have taken to extreme lengths. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, let's go back now to agriculture dispersal from the Near East. Um, so could you tell us a little bit, uh, perhaps, some of the main ways by which agriculture di dispersed from the Near East to Europe? And uh, j just uh, another question. Uh, uh, aren't there really any sites that we know of in Europe where agriculture developed independently? That's a good. That's an excellent question. It's been a long-term question. Um, that you know the 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 various possibilities for the dispersal of agriculture out of the Near East into Europe have been um, either what they call demic movement that that agriculturalists moving out of the Near East brought the whole package with them, mm -hmm. uh, or that it's a, a sort of a diffusion of the knowledge of it so that uh, they may not have moved, but the crops and the, and the, and the livestock were traded and, and the note that the knowledge, the how to of growing them transferred through time or actual independent domestication. Um, and basically the answer is, is, a, B, and C, all of the above, that I think all of those things happened. But as we get a better record, we're seeing that there's a, uh, a, a different balance of how that happened. Uh, pr the primary disperser of agriculture into Europe seems now to be the actual movement of the whole crops and livestock and people moving into Europe. And we have very good evidence of that with archaeological sites across Europe. Uh, the earliest movement that we see is actually goes back, oh, 11,000 years or so ago um, into out of the Near East onto Cyprus, where people uh, are putting uh, not only plants that they've been manipulating, but animals, things like cattle, which must have been huge. And you, you think of these cattle, these giant cattle that they're moving in boats uh, across the Cyprus is, is really something. Um, but we begin to see them moving that kind of early nascent um, domestication, maybe agriculture, into Cyprus. We have great records now coming into Greece. We have them in, in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe. We also not only have the archaeological, we have them across the Iberian Peninsula as well, moving into, into Portugal, moving into Spain. So we have a, a good record of these sites that so that we have a, a record of both the whole complex of, of Near Eastern plants and animals that are moving in. We have the pottery, we have the lifestyle, we even have the genetics then of the humans that we see the trace of these movements of people out of Anatolia into Europe. So that was a primary disperser of plants and animals and technology and people into Europe. But at the same time, we had indigenous plants or um, hunters and gatherers in Europe um, that were uh, there, uh, that we have a good record now um, that initially the, the um, colonists came in and settled in areas where there really weren't too many hunters and gatherers. They established along the Mediterranean little enclaves uh, as they went by boat across the Mediterranean where they had these little farming pioneering colonies that they established um, and the same thing as they went over land in Europe. But in other areas in Europe, um, there were very uh, successful what we call these complex hunter and gatherers, largely um, less mobile, largely sedentary hunters and gatherers that were um, exploiting a whole diverse array of, of wild resources in their, in their local environments. And they came into contact with these new agriculturalists. And for in many cases, and we have great records now from Portugal uh, and Spain, uh, also from Northern Europe, they resisted. They didn't adopt uh, the, the farming way of life. Uh, and we know that they were in contact, we know they were trading, um, but they, they didn't do that. They didn't adopt it. 
Um, but over time, and it may be because they're beginning to intermarry and they're beginning to have more contact, we see them beginning to adopt some of the plants and animals from the agriculturalists that have moved in, the colonists, and begin to adapt them in very localized ways. So we have a very good record of both what they call the demic movement, the colonists moving in, which may be the primary pulse, but then people indigenous to Europe um, adapting these new crops and livestock in very individualistic ways. We also have some example of them beginning to play with their own resources um, that are local um, in ways that lead to their domestication. So, for example, we have a, a genetic records that things like rye and oats uh, that people actually in the Near East were playing with but didn't domesticate. Um, they were domesticated in Europe. Now, it may have been from the example of the Near Eastern crops and livestock moving in, but that was an independent domestication of those, those crops there. There's a lot of talk back and forth about whether pigs, which wild boar, as you know, are found throughout Europe and, and in the Near East. We have a good record that the Near Eastern pigs moved in. We have a genetic record. We can trace them moving in and uh, showing up as far as west as Paris by about 4,000 years ago. Um, but over time, the pigs with the signature of the European wild boar take over, and those are the dominant domesticate. And the question is, is did people then independently domesticate them from the example of the Near Eastern, um, and how did that come along? So it becomes very complex. Once again, the whole question becomes very complex and mixed. So it's a, it's, it's a mixed process, primarily in Europe, demic, uh, but a great deal of local um, adoption and very creative innovation of how they uh, uh, adopted these new technologies uh, and then applied them to local resources. We have a very different record for, for Africa, by the way. Um, where it spread to Africa, um, along the coast of Africa and down the Nile Valley, where the environmental conditions were suitable for growing the whole sort of complex of, of crops and livestock, we see the same sort of demic move. But as you get farther south, it becomes impossible. The, 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 the plant seasons are all different and they're all wrong, and, and the Near Eastern crops in particular don't do well. And what we seem to think that the record in, in Africa is, is that local people, uh, indigenous people, um, take the primary, that are more mobile, that are following wild herds of animal, are adopting selectively um, domesticates, sheep, goat, primarily goat, because they do better in the arid environments, and cattle, and are then incorporating them into their more nomadic round and that they're utilizing them maybe not so much for meat but at this point actually utilizing them for things like milk um, and uh, maybe their blood and we're getting um, wonderful records of the milk residue from the insides of pots which is another technique that we're beginning to be able to, to do to show that they were actually milking these animals and beginning to do that so we have a very different trajectory there um, so it you know it, it I think and then we're beginning to understand the movement east into, into China, where the Near Eastern crops and livestock move in uh, across, um, um, you know, Central Asia and then into Eastern Asia, and then are incorporated into the systems uh, that the Chinese um, or the people in the east actually develop themselves. Uh, so again, it's it's it, it all depends on sort of local conditions on the ground, the environment. Um, the, also the culture receptivity to it or not uh, in that. And again, another area where at least to my mind this becomes so exciting is that we have all these tools now from archaeology, genetics, chemistry, and so on, where we can watch it spread and see how these different forces work in different places. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so uh, let me just ask you one last question or about one last topic. 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Anthropocene because nowadays people talk a lot about that because also due to climate change and things like that. So uh, looking back on our history and our evolutionary history more concretely, uh, people mention agriculture a lot when it comes to humans really starting to have a, a significant environmental impact on the planet. Uh, so so um, did agriculture really from its very inception um, created those sorts of conditions where people started having uh, a, a, an environmental impact that we can look back with our modern techniques and technologies and science and really see that if it weren't for that kind of human activity then things would have been significantly different in terms of environment. Yeah, well, I would I would argue that. I mean, the Anthropocene, um, the concept is basically uh, trying to define an era where humans become drivers of Earth systems, mm -hmm. where we become the primary mechanism behind that. And uh, there's been a huge amount of attention in out of out of um, geology where they're very focused on coming up with markers of geologic eras um, and it's been proposed that the Anthropocene is a new geologic era, the era of, of human um, as the sort of uh, in the driver's seat of earth systems. And there's been a huge amount of um, discussion about where does it start and how do we mark it in the, in the, in the geologic record. Um, and so, you know, it, uh, people have said, you know, well, it's the Industrial Revolution where we've really transformed the atmosphere and we can see spikes in carbon and so on that, that affect that. Or uh, it's even been defined as uh, recently as 1950s where atmospheric ch uh, changes due to the atomic bomb are detectable in the geologic record. I think that that's a sort of a, a, a fake argument about where does it start. And I think what we would... And, and I'm not so much concerned about saying when we're in the Anthropocene. I think, but the concept itself is very powerful, is, is what were the levers by which humans began to become bigger players in changing the environment? And, and as I mentioned to you, humans from the beginning of modern humans and maybe even earlier, one of our sort of uh, basic uh, parts of our toolkit is our ability to play with the environment. So we've been doing this since we've been human. Yeah. Uh, but agriculture, um, domestication, and then primarily leading into these systems that are based primarily on domestic crops and livestock are a tremendous lever in that direction uh, because they begin then to change uh, landforms you're, you're clearing forests to, to develop those for fields. Uh, you are changing species. You're creating whole new species of plants and animals through this manipulation that you're doing. Um, you are moving out uh, the free living plants and animals. You are beginning um, in another wave of extinctions or at least lo local extirpations of, of animals from these areas. And you are massively changing the environment. Uh, and the, um, not only the environment, but the atmosphere. And that, that primarily comes when you begin to, to do a lots of clearing for, of landscapes, you're beginning to burn forests. And that introduces a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. And the other thing that is a major change in the atmosphere is the offtake of methane from animals. Uh, you're having lots more animals. You're having a lot of animals that, that chew their cud and have these long digestive systems and emit huge amounts of methane gas. And that has, um, has a detectable spike in the atmosphere that dates back, I don't know, maybe 6,000 years or so. Now, well after agriculture starts, but it becomes then something that is actually detectable um, in atmospheric changes. So... I would say that that the Anthropocene begins um, be, to really take up steam uh, with agriculture, with that human ability to not just tinker around the edges of our environments, but to massively change it. Um, and I think it's very important. It really then, you know, um, 
archaeologists sometimes have a hard time explaining why we exist. Uh, it, it, you know, why, why is it important to know about how these things happened in the past? Who cares? Um, but the concept of the Anthropocene, I think, really um, helps answer that question. That we're in a position now where we have huge responsibility over the Earth that we have changed Earth systems to a tremendous degree and, and potentially soon, and maybe not even soon now, to a catastrophic degree. Yeah. Um, and understanding how we came to be in that position. What was that history? It didn't happen yesterday. It didn't happen with the atomic bomb. It didn't happen with the Industrial Revolution. It, it really goes all the way back in our history. And how did we begin that course and how did we maybe even more importantly how did we navigate it in a way that was sustainable and are there ways that we learn about um, both our mistakes and our successes in the past that can help inform us now with what we're doing and I think that makes the kind of work that we're doing that gives us this deep time perspective on human history uh, that that brings us right to the present, that gives us important insight into who we are as a species, um, our responsibility for uh, the environment. And it's not enough to say, as some people do, well, we've been doing this for hundreds and thousands of years, you know, that's just what we do. No, we, we have been doing it for hundreds and thousands of years, but by doing that, we've assumed responsibility for that and it's not only for the goodness of the earth but it's for the survival of our species and we mm -hmm. have that knowledge and that power in our hands and by understanding how we've come to that maybe will help us be better proctors of our own present and future mm -hmm. okay great so uh, dr zither let's end on that note and before we go uh, would you like to mention some places on the internet or elsewhere where people could get in touch with your work? Um, I'm um, on Academia EDU, which has a good deal of my um, uh, publications as well as ResearchNet. Um, and uh, I'm reachable as you um, got to me through the Smithsonian. Uh, as well, so and I'm good about answering questions now in my quarantine and my retirement years. Um, so uh, I think those are primarily, and then through things like YouTube, I have a number of I I don't remember because I don't pay much attention to these things, but there are a number of my lectures and so on um, that can be found uh, on the internet. And so if I haven't bored you enough through this one, um, there's more of me to be had. Um, and I, I'm very uh, happy to engage with people. I do quite frequently. I am very busy writing about arcane things on pig teeth right now, but uh, I do come up for air every once in a while, and I'm happy to talk about broader issues. Okay, so I will be leaving links to your work in the description box of the interview so that people can go and check it out. It's very interesting. And Dr. Zeder, thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. And it was a real pleasure to meet you and to talk to you. And likewise, Ricardo. It was great. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. Uh, I have a lot of new patrons now, so uh, I'm trying to get that uh, 100 as soon as it's possible to try to get also at 800 euros of sub monthly support. So let's see if we can get there. I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there, any amount you feel comfortable with. And otherwise, you can also make a one-time donation on PayPal or also um, you can monthly subscribe on PayPal. I have all the links in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, 
Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Marco Neves, Max Bailby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Kavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Rob Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormer, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dan Bauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Al Herzog. My producers is Arwebe, Rosie, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Dr. Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, and Matthew Lavender, and my executive producer, Michel Ruzieski. Thank you for all.